Hey, everybody, and welcome to Conversations at the Montclair Film Festival. I'm Stephen Colbert, and I am so happy to be talking to today's guest, um, partly because he's a giant in his field and also because I always enjoy talking to him. I just did it recently, actually. He is a writer, a producer, a director. He is known for his sharp, fast-paced dialogues, often taking place in the backstage worlds of politics and entertainment. You know him from writing Malice, The American President, Charlie Wilson's War, The Social Network, for which he won the Academy Award, Moneyball, and Steve Jobs. He wrote and directed Molly's Game in 2017, and his latest project that he wrote and directed is The Trial of the Chicago Seven. We want to underscore again that we're coming to Chicago peacefully, but whether we're given permits or not, we're coming. We're going to Chicago to protest the Vietnam War. And there's no place to be right now but in it. We watched for a decade while these rebels without a job tell us how to prosecute a war. Well, they're going to spend their 30s in a federal facility, real time. People say, you know, Abby, are you concerned about an overreaction from the cops? Holy shit. You all right? No words Abby, until I saw that. Are the people ready to make opening arguments? At the defense table. Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, Dave Dellinger, Rennie Davis, Lee Weiner, John Freund, Tom Hayden, and Bobby Seale. These defendants had a plan, and the plan was to incite a riot. I call this portion of the trial with friends like these. <laughs> my trial's begun without my lawyer. The court assumes you are being represented by the Black Panther sitting behind you. The riots were started by the Chicago Police Department. Sustained. Nobody objected. Jurors 6 and 11, they're with us. Juror number 6 and juror number 11, you're dismissed from this jury. Can you tell us why? Because this is my courtroom. We've dealt with jury tampering, wiretapping, a defendant that was literally gagged. Get your hands off me! You are the first to suggest that I have discriminated against a black man. Then let the record show that I'm the second. When we walked in here this morning, they were chanting that the whole world is watching. If we leave here without saying anything about why we came in the first place, it'll be heartbreaking. The last summer, why did you come to the convention? To end the war. We're giving them exactly what they want, a stage and an audience. Yeah, you really think there's gonna be a big audience? Here I am! This is what revolution looks like, real revolution. We may have to hurt somebody's feelings. Is this prosecution politically motivated? I'm tired of hearing you. It would be impossible for me to care any less what you are tired of. Here I am! The watching! There will be more! The watching! We have to find some courage now. The watching! The watching! How much is it worth to you? What's your price? To call off the revolution? My life. Open your eyes, cause a new day is dawning. The new day is dawning. Oh, Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Aaron Sorkin. Aaron, good to see you again. It's great to see you, Stephen. I'm re I'm really excited to talk about uh, the trial of the Chicago Seven. I I saw it last week. I was um, not only do I enjoy it as a movie, I was deeply moved um, oh. by the messages of it, and which is not uncommon from an Aaron Sorkin project. I uh, I, I enjoy the way that you get inside my head and my heart at the same time, and you've got this you've got this magic tool you use, which is your dialogue. And often your monologues, you, you give the people who need to say the right thing, the right thing to say. And I wish you wrote my life sometimes. <laughs> uh, uh, listen, that's a great compliment, especially uh, coming from you. You know, uh, before a, a movie or a play or an episode of television, before, before a film can be anything else, before it can be relevant, before it can be provocative, before it can be uh, persuasive, it has to be good. Uh, it has to be a good story well told. It has to uh, meet the rules of drama. So that, that's what I'm thinking about when, uh, when I'm writing a movie. I'm thinking about the audience experience. Uh, and if it, 
if it's the right subject uh, and you treat it in the right way and it kind of crashes into the times that we're living in, uh, sometimes it can be more than a good movie. But making a good movie is not a modest goal. Uh, making something that you can enjoy with a bucket of popcorn uh, isn't a modest goal. But it turned out that this ended up being more than that. I, I, comp I completely agree. I think that uh, it, it is. It's a, it's a perfectly uh, um, honorable goal to make a good movie. But, and, and before we get into your specific movies and the, your specific television projects that you've created over the years, I want to talk to you about, like, what were your influences? What Can you think of, like, an early movie that you looked at and you said, oh, my God, I love the way that sounds. I love the way that looks. Something that affected you deeply when you were younger that you might see showing back up in your aesthetic. Yeah. Uh, I can, um, but it uh, the, the first things to affect me that way weren't movies, they were plays. Uh, my parents took me to the theater all the time, just as a matter of habit. They went to the theater uh, um, when, <clears throat> when they were first married. It was affordable, uh, more affordable uh, when I was a kid. So they took me to see plays all the time. Oftentimes I was too young to understand what was going on uh, up there. Like who's afraid of Virginia Woolf when I was eight years old? Uh, that kind of thing. And I, so I didn't know what was going on up there, but I loved the sound of dialogue. It sounded like music to me and I wanted to imitate that sound. And uh, I've always been kind of an accidental screenwriter. It's, it's been a happy accident, but uh, I'm plays are what I know, plays are what I studied. And uh, I always feel like when I, uh, uh, when I do a movie or, or, television i'm kind of a playwright trying to get away with doing uh, a play on screen well um all right i i can see that I'm, I'm just curious you see accidental screenwriter are you also an accidental playwriter because i know you studied musical theater you were to be an actor right that was the goal yeah and, and a singer and a dancer um uh, yes i have a bachelor we don't see enough of that from you why don't we ever see <laughs> Lisa stop you or a time step or anything you wouldn't want to what there was a moment uh, I, I did your show and there was a moment you and I almost sang a number from Sunday in the Park together. Uh, but for whatever reason, the conversation went in a different direction. Was it finishing a hat? It was finishing the hat. Um, uh, we, that was almost going to happen. Uh, okay. But it, but it didn't. We got uh, an hour. We got an hour interview here. <laughs> you, never, you never know. So, yes, I am. Uh, I'm crazy about musicals. Uh, and uh, I, I, until I was 21, really, until the moment I graduated from college, I thought that I was going to be an actor, and I thought I was going to be an actor uh, in, in musicals. What was and, the musical that you want? What's the part? What is the musical part that, given your druthers, even if you're not right for it, you'd want to do? Okay, well, Harold Hill in The Music Man. Really? Uh, I, oh, yeah, are you kidding? I, by the way, I can, if you want, I can do Trouble in River City for you. Please. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I would also, I could never sing it, but, um, uh, you know, playing Don Quixote in Man of La Mancha. Sure. Uh, That's a great song to sing, like, when you've had a few, too. Because you can get everybody in the room going at the same time. Oh, yeah, and everybody's going to cry. It's I am my Don Quixote, the Lord of La Mancha, my chest on Nichols, and I go. Look at you. Okay, so what, Stephen, seriously, what, I understand me <laughs> falling in love with that. What, what happened to you? What happened to me? Oh, yeah. I, I, I went to a place called Second City, and I learned about improvisation, and I went, that's it. You don't have to remember as many lines. I'll do okay. that. But that's not an excuse for knowing the lyrics to... <laughs> I am I'm, I'm, I'm one of 11 kids in my family. We all think we can sing. And at every wedding, we take we tell the band to go home and we just sing ourselves. Um, for me, the part that I shouldn't play, that I want to play, uh -huh. is Judas from Jesus Christ Superstar. Oh, gee, that's a great part. It's the greatest. Yeah. Um, you know, you're, you're not what we commonly think of if you're casting uh, uh, that nope. part. Nope. Um, I'm not Murray Head. You do it. Yeah. Not night only. Now, now, what about? Okay, so I I, I know. See you go, Jesus. You've started to believe. I have things that say of you. You really do believe. This talk of God is true. We can do the whole thing. Drop that needle anywhere on the record. I'm ready to go, baby. 
<laughs> People too. think I'm really Catholic, but I'm really Jesus Christ superstar. <laughs> no. So let's go back. So um, um, who's afraid of Jenny Wolf? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've seen plays like that, like that championship season. Sure. Uh, uh, these plays, which I'm either not old enough or not smart enough uh, to understand, but I love the sound of dialogue. It sounds like music to me. Mm -hmm. um, and How about A Man for All Seasons? Oh, I, I love A Man for All Seasons. I, I, that dialogue crackles too. I'll say it. So does The Crucible. And I, I listen, I could list, and in all different kinds of styles, Mamet, uh, who, you know, has turned uh, two people who have difficulty communicating into a virtuoso uh, <laughs> duet that they're doing. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe it's like jazz. It's the words you can't find. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, no one writes people who can't communicate better, <laughs> better than Mamet does. Well, how about in how about in movies? I I suspect okay. you're a Patty Chayefsky fan. Yes, uh, uh, of course. I uh, love Patty Chayefsky, um, and you know, Network is a phenomenally written, phenomenally made film but interestingly th this whole time that i was uh, a loving place i was watching movies and television as much as anybody would but e even in my 20s when uh, uh when i started writing for some reason i just never thought of it as that's also something i can do or maybe you should go to los angeles where there are entry-level jobs that are very hard to get, but at least they exist. You can be a writer's assistant. You can write a spec script and have a, have a writing sample. I just stayed in New York, and I was going to be a playwright, and it wasn't until I saw broadcast news, okay? Now, that wasn't when I was a little kid. Uh, it wasn't until I saw broadcast news that for some reason it occurred to me, huh, you know, Jim Brooks wrote that. I would have liked to have written that. that it feels like... That, that's something I'd enjoy uh, uh, doing, uh, writing that script. So that, that, that was the first time I thought, movies are like plays, except, uh, t you know, just a little bit different. Well, what about the physical act of writing? Or rather, maybe not the physical act of writing, but at least the, the there's something physical to writing, that, that, that starting to write. Um, I, when I was in my 20s, I found, I wanted to write. I found it literally kind of painful to start the process because I had so much in my head and so little that it could get to my fingers that it was, it almost felt physically painful to start and fail and start and fail. So I just wouldn't do it. And it wasn't until sort of necessity drove me to do it that I broke through my own, um, uh, I guess, fear of it. Well, I know that pain really well. And starting is the hardest part. Uh, for me, the difference between being on page two and being on page nothing is life and death. But, uh, there's a there's a big part of the process. Uh, it's it's if you did a pie chart, it would be more than half of the writing process that doesn't look anything like writing. Um, uh, like if if you just observed me during the day, uh, you would say you know you've been doing nothing for weeks or months, but just kind of pacing around, climbing the walls, lying on the couch and watching ESPN and moaning about how you how you haven't started yet, um, and. I haven't, I'm not procrastinating. I just, you have to think of it before you can write it. Um, uh, you don't sit down at the keyboard and say, okay, characters, take over. Uh, let me be the vessel through which you speak. You need an intention and an obstacle. Uh, you have to obey the rules of, uh, uh, of drama. Uh, you need to organize uh, your thoughts and you need to know what the first scene is gonna be. You don't need to know what the last scene is going to be, but you do need to know what the first scene is going to be before you write it. How often when you, how often when you write that first scene and then you get back to your final draft of that thing, how often does that first scene survive? Almost always uh, does that first scene survive. Uh, there's plenty that doesn't survive by the time you get to the end of the first draft. And then I strongly recommend uh, uh, to anyone that, you know, when you're writing, don't keep going back and starting over and starting over. Get to the end, even though you know if it's if you know that it's wrong. Get to the end. By the time you get to the end, you're gonna know a lot more about this thing that you're writing than you did at the beginning. It's, it, you know, it's the old story about Michelangelo and the, uh, you know, how did, how did you carve David sure. of marble and I just chipped away everything that wasn't David. You're gonna get to fade out, 
Uh, and know you're going to know a lot more than you did at the beginning. You can start to chip away everything that isn't your movie and kind of start to hang a lantern on the stuff that is your movie and write this scene that you need in the first act to make this thing in the third act uh, pay off. Uh, but I cannot off the top of my head think of a time that that first scene changed. I'm probably wrong. Uh, there probably has been a time, but I just can't think of one. And when it comes to the David, you, you, you know where we'd be hanging the lantern. Now, I have a question for you. Do you think well, that... I want to acknowledge that I both understood and appreciated that joke. <laughs> the, do you think Michelangelo actually said that? Because that actually really... I've always thought that sounds more like George S. Kaufman than Michelangelo. I don't think there's any chance that Michelangelo uh, uh, said that. It First of all, how would we know, really? And second of all, it just doesn't sound like something. <laughs> well, it's so It sounds really clever. For a guy who was kind um, of reckless. It, it, you're, you're right. That it sounds more like George S. Kaufman. Um, so, by the way, I'm not sure the quote has ever been attributed to Michelangelo. I think it's just about Mike. Oh, no, it is attributed. It's how did you carve David? I just chucked. Yeah. yeah. There's no chance he said that. No, Probably I don't think any way you guys say it. It's, it's a good compass to go by. So okay, well that's good to know. That that's interesting. That 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 initial scene generally survives. And a great advice, I would agree. Get to the end. Get it done. Then look back. And I tend when I when I do it, but I don't write on the scale you do. I just get it on page and go. Okay, what was the what is the tendency of these ideas? What it what is? That's right. I learned from the thing I just wrote. I read it again. I go, what the fuck did I mean? And don't worry that uh, that it's not the necessarily the thing that you set out to write. Okay. You set out going due north, but during somewhere during the the journey, you started going a little bit east, and uh, uh, and so instead of winding up at this point, you thought you were going to wind up, you wound up over there. It doesn't matter. You took a trip. Uh, uh, you went from A to B, and you need to do that. Uh, uh, so don't worry that it didn't end up being the thing that you thought it was going to be. Uh, the thing that you thought it was going to be is now another idea you have. You can do next. So you're you're. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but your breakthrough is A Few Good Men on Broadway. You're 28? Yeah, it was my breakthrough. It was the first thing I ever wrote. Um, Wait, it's the first thing you ever wrote? Yeah. Uh, I, I wrote like, it. I, I don't I like Aaron Sorkin. <laughs> hey, listen, but I also, um, uh, it was the first thing I ever wrote. But the final draft, the one that was ultimately done on Broadway, was probably the 28th thing I wrote. I, I wrote many, many drafts that I had to learn. Okay. Um, but I was, I had a bunch of uh, survival jobs uh, at the time. You know, everything sure. a struggling artist does. What'd you do? Um, or I, I love hearing people's get by jobs. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I, I bust tables, I drove a limo, I dressed up as a moose in Times Square and passed out leaflets. Uh, I worked at the Half Price Tickets booth, DKTS. Um, and mostly, I attended bar at Broadway theaters. And uh, A Few Good Men, the first draft of A Few Good Men, was written on cocktail napkins during the first act of Lacage of Fall. Lacage. Lacage. Should is, we? Is, is that why Jack Nicholson's character is such a drama queen? Yeah, yeah. You know, and he breaks into I am what I am. And what I am needs no excuses. How good of a bartender are you? Okay, I just need to ask you something really quickly because you're savvy about social media. That little moment there of me singing I am what I am, is that going to start showing up in... Like, it's already blown up on Instagram. Out. That That's huge. It's a TikTok. <laughs> you're already... <laughs> All right. How yeah, good of a bartender were you? What's the difference between a Gimlet and a Gibson? An onion is the difference. Well, that, that's it. That's a, a, a Gibson and a Martini is the onion. Gimlet is with lime juice. I was going to get to the lime juice. I know how to tent bar. I know how to tent bar. Um, uh, I'll tell you what I can make, which you appear to enjoy on your show, at least a prop version of it. Those are old fashions you're drinking, right? They are never prop versions. The rule on the show is uh, in rehearsal, it's iced tea. During the show, it's liquor. And I, I and everybody knows, and that's been 15 years now. What I had iced tea the other night in a flask while we were broadcasting, I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and everybody in the crew laughed because they knew that somebody messed up. It's real deal, man. 
Real Good. deal. It, it feels like uh, you deserve it in those moments when you take a sip. That's what I think. Yeah, and like we all feel like, yes, that's what I want right now, too. Just a sip of bourbon, please. Stanislavski was not as honest as I'm being at that moment. He was all, <laughs> I, I need I need the, the sense memory. Um, what, who who encouraged you to write? Did did your family say good good for you go do that, or they're like why yeah. wouldn't you why can't you be a lawyer? Uh, listen, the the rest of my family they are lawyers, um, uh, but they uh, they really did encourage my writing. Uh, the first people to encourage it that listen, what ha I I never wrote for pleasure. I never wrote uh, for any reason other than a chore to be gotten through for a school assignment until I was 21 years old, until after I got out of, uh, graduated college, I came to New York. I was sharing a tiny studio apartment with my ex-girlfriend. I don't mean that she's my ex-girlfriend now. I mean, she was my ex-girlfriend then when we were sharing the tiny studio apartment and she had just started dating my best friend. But wow. You don't care when you need shelter in New York. That's, that's small potatoes. Sure. $200 a month, I got to sleep on a futon, okay? And there was this one weekend where a friend of mine who was, he was a budding journalist, had with him his grandfather's semi-automatic typewriter. That's electric keys and a manual return. And he asked me if I could hang on to it uh, for the weekend because he was going out of town. And I said, sure. My ex-girlfriend, roommate, was also out of town on the Strawberry Shortcake tour because she played Strawberry Shortcake. Okay. She was a dancer. Um, it was one of these Friday nights in New York where you feel like everyone's been invited to a party that you haven't been invited to. I don't think I had $3 in my pocket and nothing in the apartment that could entertain you was working. The, the TV, the stereo, that was it. All there was was my friend's grandfather's semi-automatic typewriter. And I stuck a piece of paper in it. Wait, what is a semi-automatic typewriter? Does it have a bump stock? What does that mean? Electric keys and a manual return. Okay, good. Um, and I stayed up all night uh, writing. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it was no good at all, but it was. But I loved it because uh, it was dialogue. It was the first time I was writing dialogue. It was the first time I was writing for pleasure. In the morning, I called a couple of friends of mine and asked them to come over. I didn't have the money to make copies at Kinko, so they, they shared the pages, they read them out loud, and they were really encouraging. They said, hey, this is good, you should keep uh, doing this. And I think that if they hadn't, if they'd said, this is, you know, this is bad, uh, that, that would have been it. Um, but I still wasn't, it's not easy to give up your identity as an actor and just say, okay, I'm, uh, I'm a writer now. I'd spent my entire life thinking that I was an actor. So while I was writing A Few Good Men, I took four days off and I wrote a one-act play, submitted it to New York has several really good one-act play festivals. Um, and I submitted it to one of them. It was accepted. And I cast myself in the play alongside Nathan Lane. And uh, we were on stage and I was watching Nathan Lane, like in my play, thinking, God, this guy is really good. Wouldn't it be great if every actor in my play was this good? <laughs> and that was it for me as an actor. That's what <laughs> it is. That is, I can imagine the humbling moment to be on. Yeah, when you, when, you're, <laughs> when you re realize you do not belong on the same stage. So the fact that you were stuck with this typewriter and that the only form of entertainment was your own mind, kind of greatness was thrust upon you for that weekend. You had to, you had to do it. I, I never thought of it that way, but I like the way that sounds. I have the thing that when young people say to me, how do I do what you do? Or how do I do what I want to do? And I say, um, I say, get in trouble. Because I had a friend, um, I, we'd actually, we'd gone to college together, but we didn't know each other in college. After we got out, we'd done one play together in Chicago and and didn't really know each other that well, but we, we jived a little bit. And he just called me up one day and he said, do you want to get in trouble? And And what he meant was, Without having told me, uh, he had called a theater. He knew the theater was between two productions, so they had an empty stage and said, can we have the theater that weekend? We'll give you like the house, just let us use your stage. He named the play without having written the play wow. and said that I was in it and he was in it and we were gonna do it. He said, do you wanna get in trouble? And I said, I just said, yes. And then he told me what he meant. He goes, well, we're on stage in nine days for a play. It's called Shoemaker. And I haven't written it. 
do you want to write it? And I said, okay. So we did. And then we did it. We got, we got really good notices. And then after that, every couple of years, he would call me up and say, do you want to get in trouble? And I knew what he meant. And what I mean when I tell young people, I say, tell somebody that you've got something you want them to re read and then go write it. Like go invite people to a stage reading. Now go write something that you want, you'd want someone to hear. Get That's yourself right. in That's trouble right. because a gun to your head sometimes is your best friend. That's right. Uh, it's fantastic advice. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm really jealous of uh, people I know, writers I know who got an MFA in playwriting from Iowa or from Yale. Uh, and, you know, I'll ask them, just tell me, you know, what happened in the class there? There's got to be information there that I could use, uh, wisdom and education there that I could use. And their thing is, they all say roughly the same thing, which is that really the most valuable part of Yale or Iowa or any place else that offers a master's degree in, uh, in playwriting is that it gives you a chance to write the worst plays you're ever going to write. Uh, and uh, like I had to do that with, my, my first play was on Broadway. So I, uh, uh, you know, you, you have a lot of people watching you and a lot of pressure when you're writing the worst plays uh, you're ever yes. going to write. And I, so I would love to be able to get in trouble, to be able to, uh, right. uh, to be risky. Um, that, that sounds great to me. I, I, not to talk about me more, but you just reminded me that I, because I've just been quarantined for two weeks because I was, I traveled back from South Carolina, my home, my home state, I had to stay in the house. So my wife and I went through everything in the house. She's like, I'll take two weeks, we'll clean. I found stuff I wrote 22 years ago because I don't throw anything away. And I just did a staged reading of it for the festival of a, of a pilot I wrote for Barry Levinson. And I'm so grateful to have gotten better over 22 years. I went and read it and went, oh my God, what are you doing? What are you doing? How did you not cut this scene? It does nothing. Well, I have a hunch you're about to get a lot of phone calls from people who would really like to read that script. Uh, but yeah, one of the things I love about being a writer is that you do get better as you get older. It's like being an orchestra conductor. Um, so you, so few good men on Broadway. Then, because that becomes the movie that that everyone knows. What's that process like? Because you also wrote the script for the yeah. movie, which doesn't always happen. Sometimes that's adapted by somebody else. You did that adaptation that's yourself. Right. What's that process like? And what did you learn about the difference between those two mediums? Uh, well, I was scared to death when I had to write. Uh, the screenplay. Remember when I started writing the play, there was nobody waiting for it on the other end. There was nobody expecting it. I hadn't been paid uh, to write it. For some reason in my mind, I, I never really imagined that it was going to get done. I thought, uh, you know, just like my two friends had come over and we read those first pages out loud, that friends would come over and we'd have potato chips and beer and we'd read A Few Good Men out loud and that would be that. Uh, with the screenplay, there was now a movie studio expecting it. Uh, uh, so not only had I never written a screenplay, I'd never read a screenplay. I didn't even know what one looked like. Uh, so I went and I bought uh, a screenplay format book. I highly recommend that no one ever looks at a screenplay format book. You'll, you'll lose your mind. I mean, literally how it's formatted or like these are the, the rules of structure? These are the rules of a screenplay format. You have to indent this much and don't, don't do that. Um, uh, I mean, I can talk about that more, but don't do that. Uh, and one of the ways I knew not to do that was because at this point, um, I had a mentor. Uh, William Goldman had taken me That's under a good his mentor. Wing. I'll say. Uh, Bill Goldman, uh, for people who don't know, uh, he passed away two years ago. Uh, but he's pretty much considered the dean of American screenwriters. Oscars sure. for All the President's Men and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Uh, he wrote both the novel and the screenplay for Princess Bride. Um, and his nonfiction, which includes uh, one of the best reads you can have on your night table, a book called Adventures in the Screen Trade, uh, is he rivals his screenplays uh, and his fiction. Anyway, uh, he just kind of identified me. He had read the, the play A Few Good Men, which at this point hadn't opened yet. It was just in rehearsal when I was writing the screenplay. Um, and uh, he felt that he could help me make that transition. Uh, and he, uh, up until the day he died, he's been uh, a, a teacher of mine. He's been the first person uh, who's gotten the pages for me. But uh, 
what happened really, and it happens, and it still happens to this day, is I try, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the person, what Rob Reiner in this case, uh, what Castle Rock in this case, what they're hoping for, what they're expecting uh, from this A Few Good Men screenplay. And I, I try to figure out what they want and, and I kind of try to give it to them and I don't get anywhere. I, 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 I can't get a half a page uh, down. And I get to this point where the clock is ticking and they're waiting for something and I just say, all right, you, you don't have a choice. You just have to write it the way you'd write it. Um, uh, and, and I do that. And uh, of course, I sort of, that's where I should have started uh, from. But uh, it's only until I have exhausted every other option that I kind of trust myself to write it. Um, with this, this is, I'm enjoying this conversation so much, I'm not hitting nearly as many questions as I had planned on, but that's fine. Is it because this, my answers are taking much longer than you anticipated? They're, 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 they're Sorkinian in no, their no. thoroughness, and which I don't want to stop. I'm not trying to peel it back. This is merely my way of saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, uh, gloss over a few data points here because I really want to get to the trial of the Chicago 7. Sure. For those of you who think this is going to be the comprehensive, definitive Aaron Sorkin interview, we may not hit everything, is my warning to the affiliates watching right now. I um, that. Okay, so West Wing, Newsroom, Studio 60, Sunset Strip, and um, uh, is, that all, is that it for TV? West Wing, Newsroom, Sports Night. Sports Night. Those are, those are your four, the TV shows that you wrote. That's right. You wrote. Okay, so what is it like? And we're going to get to some of the, the, the other films you've worked on in just a moment. But so there's the there's the the discipline of doing a play, which I assume is in some way akin to the discipline of doing a, a movie script, which is bounded in some way. Then there's a TV show. Then there's creating a show where you can't really reasonably know where it's going because it, because in success it'll outrun your. The, the immediate imagination you have for these characters' actions and wants and desires and everything. What is that like to then turn, when you when you go, I did Sports Night first, right? Sports Night, Sports then West Wing? first, then West Wing, then Studio 60 Newsroom. So how did you change your approach, or is, or is nothing different? Because you it's open-ended. It's, it's an open-ended world in a way. Here's what's different. Uh, and I love series television. I love putting on a show every week. I love working with the same people every week. Uh, and uh, you can tell different, just different stories uh, uh, with television than you can in a longer format. But uh, the problem is that if I'm writing a movie or a play and it's not, I, I've, I've run into a snowbank, uh, it's not going well, which is common. Um, I can call the producer, the studio, the director who's ever waiting for it and say, listen, I know I said I was going to deliver in August. It'll probably be more like October. Uh, and they'll understand. And even if they don't understand, they're going to have to live with it. As you well know, in television, you have hard deadlines. You have air dates uh, that you have to meet, so, which means that you have to write even when you're not writing well. And that is a tough pill to swallow when you know that you didn't get all the uh, all the bat on the ball, but you're putting it on the table anyway for the table read, and now you're going to point cameras at it, uh, and now everybody uh, is going to see it. Uh, that is the part of television that is very difficult for me. Um, so, uh, and it would happen. Uh, Sports Night was my first time writing television, so it would happen pretty frequently there. It would happen with regularity on the West Wing and with the newsroom from the beginning of the first episode to the end of the series finale. Uh, uh, it, it was like that for me. I, I loved that cast and that crew, and I'm very proud of what we did together. But I just always felt like I had a pebble in my shoe. I never felt comfortable at, in my chair uh, at the desk. I could write a good scene here and a good scene there, but I could not put an episode together. Um, and uh, uh, and that was tough. Why do you think that was? Did it have anything to do with the fact that you were- Easy. Um, no, that you were tied to, like for those of you who haven't seen it, you're, you're tied to an actual news event that had happened between 18 months to two years before that because you're, you, you, you were tied to a reality that you could not change and the, the behavior of the characters still always had to be tied to that story that you'd already decided on. That, that part wasn't plastic. I had made a decision. 
yeah, you're right, that uh, that I was tied to. And I, I, it's, a, it's a decision I think I would make again, which is that the show would take place in the very recent past, uh, as opposed to the West Wing, which is happening in a parallel universe, uh, right. okay? Uh, we don't. We never hear what year it is uh, on the West Wing. I avoided all pop cultural references because in a world where uh, Britney Spears uh, has the number one single, George W. Bush is the president. Um, anyway, that was not the newsroom. The newsroom took place in our world except a year and a half ago, uh, two years ago. Um, uh, now, as a result of that, this, this isn't why I was having difficulty writing it, uh, but as a result of that, there were many people who interpreted the show as me telling the pros how it should have been done, uh, that I'm leveraging hindsight, uh, that I'm showing you how you know the capture of bin Laden should have been covered, that I'm showing you how the shooting of Gabby Gifford should have been covered, and I absolutely was not uh, doing that. I was simply using these events um, to as another workplace uh, drama. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, uh, you know what the yips are when a golfer yeah. gets the yips? Yeah, uh, the yips, okay. yeah. Um, uh, uh, so for anyone in your audience who doesn't know, uh, a an otherwise good golfer, experienced golfer, will one day start swinging and the ball will go all over the place. It'll hit a tree. He won't be able to hit it at all. It doesn't understand what's happening. It's the same swing he's been using for decades. Uh, he's got the yips. I had the yips. I I, I, I feel you. I've been there. Halfway through yeah. my second city career in Chicago, I got the yips on stage. Oh, yeah. I couldn't talk. Literally, I, I my mouth wouldn't open and I couldn't explain it. I would have to literally massage my jaw so That's before amazing. I went on stage, so I so I could get the I like say lines like this for something, and I still enjoyed being on stage, but something weird was going on with me physically, and I broke through it. I I got through it to the other side, but I was terrified that it would never go away. It was probably something psychological that was manifesting itself uh, physically, and I am saying this because I have a full semester of Intro to Adult Psych 101. Uh, okay. It was not part of my musical theater major, but I took it anyway, and I'm glad I did. It was an elective. I pointed out to I've seen you point out a few times to a guest on your show who is uh, talking about the rigors of having to do a show every week. That <laughs> your schedule is a little different from that. <laughs> You've got to do a show every few hours. <laughs> That's a little bit. Uh, Jim Lair years ago was on uh, the old the old gig, the Colbert Report, uh -huh. and he was um, very complimentary about the the pace of the work that we did and how we did it in character, and that he sort of understood the need to both deconstruct and reconstruct falsely in character. And he goes, "How do you keep your schedule?" And I said, "Well, we have to keep our schedule. I don't know how do we do. We have to keep the schedule." And he said, "You know, sometimes." I, I, ha I have to explain that to the young people. Now, we, we're PBS, and so um, we have a lot of young people who don't get paid a lot, and this might be their first experience uh, doing something on a daily basis, and they're all very good. I'm not saying anything bad about them, but they might move on from us to a better-paying job at a certain point. And, and, and the, the other day, I, I had two young producers come to me, and I said, how's, how's the piece looking? And they said, well, we, uh, we feel really good about it. We, feel really, we really think it's going to be ready for tonight. And he said, oh, good. And if it's not, I'll just look in the camera and say, ladies and gentlemen, we really had hoped to have a show tonight. <laughs> and he goes, and they turned white as a sheet and went back to work. Hey, listen, the real miracle, I don't know how you, uh, with tuning out the news um, and with our cartoon president, uh, and the first, you know, the first five minutes of our cartoon president every week is generally about something that happened yesterday. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. that's that team. That's that animation team and the, those those executive producers. I got I got those guys kicked off, but that's all that's all them. They have an amazing process, and I am amazed. Tuning out the news is even faster. We'll do a live show for a debate or a convention, but they'll have an animated full episode by eight a.m. the next morning. They're that's amazing. What I can't get over. Uh, um, I, I have a question about uh, uh, Studio Sixty. Yes, do, do, who did you talk to? Did you talk to anybody about what it's like to to write like a sketch or a comedy show? Who was your uh, 
who was your ride along on that? I'm just curious. Yeah, uh, th there were a few SNL uh, people who who helped me out. Uh, there was unfortunately a, a mistaken impression uh, that I was going to be making fun of SNL or making fun of Lauren. Uh, which, oh no! And as a result, uh, there was um, SNL people weren't really allowed to talk to us. And it, it, that's the script I wrote for Barry Levinson. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> Uh, but um, what I was able to do is hang out at Mad TV, which was on the air at the time. That's cool. Um, That's cool. Hang people. out in their writer's room, hang out when they were shooting. That is That was not a live show, uh, yeah. or was not mostly a live show. It was mostly uh, tape segments. Um, but I, I never got behind the scenes uh, at, at SNL, which was not the problem with Studio 60. Um, well, we, we've got so many things I, I also want to hit here. Um, I'm going to skip social network. I'm just skipping it. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, you with the Oscar. I'm skipping social network. Fair enough. Um, uh, I'm going to go straight to the trial of Chicago 7 right now. We right. have another clip right here. This is um, from the courtroom. Um, this is uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt um, playing the federal prosecutor and uh, Sasha Baron Cohen uh, playing Abby Hoffman. And um, let's take a look. You have contempt for your government. I'll tell you, Mr. Schultz, it's nothing compared to the contempt my government has for me. We've heard testimony from 27 witnesses under oath that say you hoped for a confrontation with the police, that your plans for the convention were designed specifically to draw the police into a confrontation. Well, if I'd known it was going to be the first wish of mine that came true, I would have aimed a lot higher. It's a yes or no question. When you came to Chicago, were you hoping for a confrontation with the police? I'm concerned you have to think about it. Give me a moment, would you, friend? I've never been on trial for my thoughts before. One of the best moments in the movie, right there. And it's and that's the that entire exchange is not much more than than what we see in that clip right there. That's right. And yet it encapsulates so much of uh, what is on trial mm -hmm. in that moment right there. Yeah, that's right. And um I uh, Boy, I remember that day shooting that scene because it reminded me so much of the day that we shot Nicholson's courtroom uh, scene in that everybody wanted to watch. Uh, uh, everybody wanted to... Uh, it, in in this case, it was a bit of, can Ali G, can Borat, uh, uh, you know, do this serious scene? Um, can he really sound like he's from Worcester, Mass? Yeah. <laughs> Is he going to say, my wife... Um, um, so, nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, so 120 extras who, you know, the camera is not pointing at them uh, at the moment. We're, we're there watching. Uh, everybody's watching. And the other defendants, the other actors, um, uh, were, were there just for Sasha. Um, uh, you know, uh, so uh, it's a great performance from him. It's a great performance from Joe Levitt. It's a great uh, performance from Sasha Baron Cohen and from Mark Rylance and for Reddy Med, Ed, Eddie Redmayne. What's the deal with all the Brits, Aaron? In this What's unique going on? It's American story, story. why is half the cast British? Um, I, I hear you cry. Uh, you hear my cry. I'm not crying. This is a cry of freedom. You, no, no, no. I didn't mean weep. I meant, you know. Yes, yeah, sure. That, that kind I'm of cry. and call for justice. It's I'm a uh, put the best athlete on the field kind of guy. Put the best actor out there. Art should not recognize international borders. Uh, okay, you do not have to be Danish to play Hamlet. I'm I'm that guy. Fourteen years in the, in the making. Why did this take so long to get this movie done? Yeah, um, I, it was fourteen years ago. Uh, Steven Spielberg asked me to come over to his house on a Saturday morning. Thud. Just to be clear, that's okay. If you would just let me say what I was going to say, that would have been unnecessary that moment. I was going to say that that is not common. Okay, I don't hang out with Spielberg, <laughs> uh, but he told me 
you, you want to make a movie about the Chicago 7 um, mm. and this trial. And I said, that sounds great. I am in. Count me in. Left, called my father, and said, Dad, who are the Chicago 7? And what was this trial? <laughs> I was just saying yes to Spielberg as anybody would. Right. Um, but the last thing he said to me before I left his house was that he said it would be great if we could release this movie before the election. He did not specify which election. So I feel that I'm right on time. Your question was, why did it take so long to make? Right. And even by Hollywood standards, 14 years uh, is a long time. Um, at first, it was a silly reason, which was that the day after I turned in uh, the script, the Writers Guild went on strike. Uh, and, and that's 2000, right. 2007. Correct. Uh, it was, it would, then it would have been it would have been Halloween. You turned it in on Halloween because it was November first, two thousand seven. The strike went on strike, and I know because my writers went on strike. I I want to hear about that. I, I do because that's it gets dicey with the late night guys. Um, yeah, um, yeah. I'll answer anything you want, but but uh, it's with everything that was going on. The fact that it was also Halloween did not uh, occur to me. Although it ought to have, because in 2007, my daughter would have been six years old. Um, uh, so Halloween would have been a big deal uh, in my house. Anyway, it then, it kept getting kicked down the road. And honestly, the biggest reason, the riots. Uh, the riots were a budget buster. Mm -hmm. uh, for, a, you know, for any film, uh, you've got to be able to fit into a budget it's proportional to what the studio feels the appetite for the film is going to be. Um, I, quirk, and, aside, quirk aside, director. Yes. I love the intercutting of your footage and the actual riots. Thank you. That's and a penny pincher no, right done. there. That's by, by, all credit to Faden Papa Michael, our DP, and Alan Baumgarten, uh, our editor. Uh, ultimately, what happened, what got it made, was the confluence of two events. One, Donald Trump started getting nostalgic at his rallies about the old days when they take that guy out of here on a stretcher and punch him right in the face and beat the yeah. crap out of him. Don't be too gentle. Don't be too gentle. It's the demonization of protest was coming in that form. It was coming in the attacks on the athletes who were kneeling during the national anthem uh, to protest police brutality. Um, Congresswomen were being told to go back where they came from. Uh, yeah. I'll go back to your own countries. All of that happening. And at the same time, I directed my first movie, Molly's Game. And Stephen was sufficiently pleased with Molly's Game that he thought I should direct Chicago 7. The time to make the movie was now. How are you going to do the riots? That's your problem. Uh, uh, let's go. Let's do it. And when Steven Spielberg says, we're making a movie now, things start moving very fast. Um. It's your second time directing a feature. Does it get easier? Uh, it does not get easy, or it certainly hasn't yet. You you learn the first time. Again, you're learning in front of an awful lot of people and using other people's money uh, to do it with. Um, but you you learn, um, and you take what you've learned uh, to the next project. And mostly, uh, at least what I do, is I, I really lean heavily on the people around me. I have, for instance, in I, I've been a professional writer uh, for 30 years now, uh, and I have managed to absorb none of the science of filmmaking. Um, I could not pick a lens out of a police lineup. Uh, I don't know anything about light and shadow. Until I directed, until Molly's Game, I would watch a movie. I would watch The Social Network when Fincher would have me, you know, here's the cut I want you to watch. I'd watch it with my eyes closed. Um, uh, I'd be going like this. I'd just be listening to it. So composing a frame, the fact that there's any visual element to cinema at all is kind of an imposition on what I'm trying to do. So I need people who love that stuff and who are great at it. As a, as a film director, you are great at radio. It's exactly right. Um, and that's exactly right. You know, can I tell you something? One of the my favorite compliments uh, that I've gotten. Remember that one act play I told you about that I did with Nathan Lane? That was the yeah. last time yes, um, yes, I yes. acted. Yeah. Um, by the way, we did it at a place called the West Bank Cafe Downstairs Theater Bar, 46th Street and 10th Avenue, where Lewis Black 
ran this late night, like midnight, new what uh-huh. I play a week thing. Yeah, yeah. And he did the warm up. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what was incredible was it was absolutely Lewis Black. He just didn't have any material yet. Uh, so it was just kind of the sound and rhythm of Lewis Black without any material. And these guys yes. have got to play. <laughs> and it's like each one of them isn't who they are. They're another person with a it's different exactly name. Right. Like kids. You knew this guy was hilarious. You just wanted to give him a writing staff. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, after uh, the performance of that one-act play, a friend came up and introduced me to two people who had been in the audience who told me how much uh, they loved the play. And it wasn't until a few minutes into the conversation I realized they were both blind. Um, and I oh loved my God, that is fantastic. That, that it made no difference uh, at, at all. And that there is was fantastic. No visual information on that stage whatsoever. Um, Sasha Baron Cohen, who plays Abby Hoffman whose, uh, in some ways, role grows throughout uh, the movie, especially when after the protests and after they've been arrested and they're on trial, which goes on for uh, a year and a half? How long did the trial last? The trial lasted almost six months. Almost six months, okay. He would go, and he's essentially basically doing nightclub work, talking about the trial that day. Is that meant to be Second City in Chicago? Because... I knew about the trial of Chicago 7 because I was a member of Second City and the producers there were still the producers back in 1968 and 1969 who said the protesters would come, like the weathermen, those people, they'd come to Second City afterwards to hide from the cops. And then during the trial, Abby would go and play Julius Hoffman on stage. It's amazing that you're asking me this. Uh, It really is. First of all, yes. Abby, Jerry Rubin, Hayden, uh, a bunch of them on weekends. They were free on bail. Bobby Seal was not. He had to go in his jail cell every night. Uh, uh, the other guys were free on bail. And they'd go to colleges uh, where they'd sell out auditoriums just essentially doing stand-up of here's what happened in court this week. Uh, and the money that they made from those would go to, you know, the lawyers were working for free through the ACLU, but you need a big support step. It would go to pay for their defense. And so I wanted a big college auditorium uh, for those Abbey scenes. When it became clear to me that it was gonna be another budget buster for us to make it look like that college auditorium was filled with a thousand people, uh, um, we weren't gonna be able to do that. So I said, all right, you know what? Let's say it's Second City. Um, uh, Let's do that, give me a red brick wall um, uh, it's, it's, it's Second City now uh, uh, that he's doing it. We, we can fill that up, right? Yeah, um, 350, 352 people. I know, I used to wait tables there. Did you? I waited tables there. I answered the box office. I, I washed dishes. I, I did everything. I, I, I And then eventually I was on stage. I, I, li- I lived there. I, and is that you know, how you get on stage at Second City? Do you a start? lot of people do because if you work there, um, the improv classes were free. I and see. so the thing to do was to get a gig doing anything there. And then and then you could take classes for free. And then the classes were a way to get to know the performers because a lot of the performers taught and you kind of worked your way up. It's like a rep, almost like a rep system. And then you'd, you'd work your way into a touring company and then onto, onto the stage. And is having your name plastered on the Ed Sullivan Theater anywhere near what you thought your life was going to turn out to be? No, I, 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 I... You know the Beatles I, one I played there. What do you say? You know the Beatles once played there. Not only did the Beatles once play there, the opening play there starred a young Brit who had yet to change his name named Archie Leach. Cary Grant made his yeah. American debut on that stage in 1927. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a fabulous theater. But it back is. to Aaron Sorkin for just a second. We'll get to me. Okay, but just let's stick with the Beatles for one second because this has always fascinated me. They were not the closing act that night. And I want to know who had to follow. <laughs> what plate spinner had to follow. It was a, it was a chimp that smoked cigarettes. <laughs> and washed the duck. Oh, there's no way I'm going out there after this. One of my favorite things about being in that theater, and I haven't been in the theater for eight months, but one of my favorite things about being in that theater 
is when somebody will come back who has been a performer long enough that they were on stage with Sullivan, like Paul Simon. He was like, oh, Art and I played here a bunch. And he would tell like what it was like and what Ed was like. And, um, and to have people come on and say, like asking McCartney when I had him on, like, where did you stand? Where, where did, it, what was the actual performance? Or where were those girls when they were screaming? And to have all that come to life is extraordinary. Because the theater has not changed at all. It's a historic landmark. What do you say? I said I wouldn't have been able to get enough of that. Uh, yeah. uh, talking to those guys uh, uh, who were there. Talking to you about it. Are you in Ed Sullivan's office? Uh, I believe I am. I'm in Dave's office, uh -huh. which I believe uh, either that or the floor above was Ed Sullivan and Jackie Gleason. That's right. The Honeymooners started in that building too. The first yeah. Honeymooners were on that stage. It's, a, it's an incredible place. But b back to Sorkin, because we've we yeah. got to go in just a moment. My final question, and just a simple yes or no, sir. Did you order the code red? <laughs> You're goddamn right I did. <laughs> well, Eric, Aaron, thank you so much uh, for uh, taking this has time been a to talk with us. real pleasure. I really I enjoyed it. My answers were long, but thank you very much. They were exactly the right length. Okay. Because they were, they, they were you talking exactly the way we love. Thank you so much, Aaron Sorkin. Everybody, please, wherever you are in this favored land, give it up for today's guest, Aaron Sorkin. And thank you all very, very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. And do check out everything else in the Montclair Film Festival. Yes. Bye. So nice. Bye bye. Thank you, Aaron.